Okay? Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome uh, to the Inter-American Dialogue. Uh, it's a pleasure to have everybody here. Um, it's been almost 18 months since Pedro Paulo Kuczynski um, took office as the president of Peru. Uh, he's never had it too easy from the beginning. Uh, he won, I think, by one of the narrowest margins uh, ever in, in, in uh, election history in Latin America, uh, and also with very little representation in Congress, uh, the Congress being dominated by a party of the uh, Fuerza Popular of, uh, of Alberto Fujimori. And so politics has been uh, complicated and difficult from the beginning. At the same time, Peru has this uh, paradox or puzzle, which has uh, been around for a long time, of an economy that seems to be moving along pretty well. Uh, one of the region's best performers, uh, growing at nearly 4%. And the projections uh, for the next couple of years are also quite positive. Infrastructure projects and even some modest recovery in uh, commodity prices. But today's meeting comes at an especially uh, delicate and uncertain uh, moment uh, in Peru. At the end of the year, things usually quiet down, uh, but not in Peru, uh, where uh, they are heating up. Uh, to, I think, a level that we haven't seen, and it has to do with the relationship of the president with uh, Odebrecht, uh, the Brazilian construction company. And uh, as all of you know, there have been uh, uh, scandals not only in Brazil, but also Odebrecht-related scandals throughout many countries, about a dozen countries already in Latin America, in, including uh, Peru. Uh, most recently, what has come out, I guess just yesterday, uh, hot off the presses here, uh, so we have to uh, discuss it uh, openly, is um, um, that Odebrecht uh, provided support uh, to two banks, I guess Westfield and Capital One, uh, during the time that uh, President Kuczynski was Minister of the Economy and Prime Minister of Peru under the government of, of uh, Alejandro Toledo. Um, and uh, while Odebrecht had major infrastructure projects, important infrastructure projects going on in Peru at that time, uh, this is w at least what Odebrecht has reported. Um, and uh, the president has agreed to appear before the uh, commission in Congress, the Lava Jato Commission, I guess, today or tomorrow, I don't know, today, this afternoon, today, this afternoon um, to respond to those uh, accusations, uh, uh, which I think are quite serious. And even there have been some calls for his uh, possible removal from office uh, on these grounds. But the situation is, is, is uh, fast breaking, fast moving, and, uh, but I think we should try to get a sense of what uh, is going on and what the possible scenarios uh, might be in Peru uh, don't politically. Turn, don't turn off your cell phones, right? <laughs> right, we may get, uh, this is what they call breaking news. Uh, we may get breaking news uh, as this uh, unfolds. But we're uh, very fortunate uh, to have with us this morning, I think, the best, the best person possible to shine light on what's uh, going on uh, on this fast moving situation and to help interpret uh, uh, all of these various factors in Peru and look at some uh, what might be some uh, scenarios or possibilities. Uh, Alberto Vergara is a very uh, good friend and he's also a uh, brilliant writer and a brilliant uh, political analyst. He currently is professor of political science and social sciences at the Universidad Pacifico in Lima. He has his doctorate in political science from the University of Montreal, and he's done postdoctoral work at Harvard University, uh, where he has taught, uh, as well as, uh, as having taught in Sciences Po in, uh, in Paris uh, as well. He uh, is interviewed regularly in El Comercio uh, in Peru and is always widely cited and very influential in political discussions in Peru. 
Um, he's also uh, published in the journal Democracy, Latin American Research Review, and other uh, important journals. And he's the author of several books, uh, my favorite being Ciudadanos Sin Republica, which is a collection of his uh, very insightful essays. Um, so we're very grateful to Alberto for joining us this morning to offer his perspective and insight on the situation. And with that, uh, I'd like to start by asking him, uh, what's your take and reaction on the latest developments in Peru, Alberto? Well, first of all, Mike, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to be in uh, the dialogue, but also I will, um, uh, I want, I mean, uh, congrat congratulate you and the dialogue for opening, I don't know if you guys know, but the dialogue opened uh, its first office in Latin America this week in, um, in, in Guatemala specifically, and uh, so I, I'm sure this is going to be a, a, it's a, a terrific development, I think, for, for, for the dialogue, and, and it's going to add a lot of value on Next one, you got to keep it. Next one, yeah, why not? Uh, uh, okay, so as you said, this is so ongoing. I mean, we, we cannot imagine a conversation that is more uh, framed by uncertainty than this one. We actually don't know. This is something that uh, appeared yesterday uh, in the afternoon. And um, so developments are happening. So when I say, I mean, it's only half a joke, the, the thing about the, don't turn off the, the phone. Um, so I think we're in a very delicate situation. Uh, it's a, it's a, I think it, it is a um, major crisis uh, because what it's been made public, it's not only, um, does not only show and prove that the president lied, but now that he lied about committing a crime. Before he was lying about something that he was, you know, as a person, he could have done some consultancy for Odebrecht while he was not uh, a public servant. But now what is clear from the revelation from yesterday is that actually he received money from Odebrecht while he was the Minister of Economy, Prime Minister, and also the President of uh, Proinversion, which is the um, uh, institution in charge of monitoring and uh, the big investments in the country. So that uh, is a crime. You cannot receive money from, uh, there, there is a clear conflict of interest in there. So uh, this is a major revelation and, uh, and something that truly strikes me is if this is true, I mean, we cannot just uh, rule out that this is, uh, for sure, this Odebrecht has um, provided these papers, these documents, and honestly, since they are interested in saving their assets in Peru, what they want is to save their assets in Peru, I don't think that it would be very smart to present fake documents or forged documents in order to uh, um, uh, take those assets back. So what I don't understand if, again, those documents are um, legitimate or, or true, um, it's how is that the president is so irresponsible to have lied about this so many times? How can he think that he could get away with this under all the um, lights? Uh, he lied for the first time in 2016 when he declared with the uh, legislative committee in 2016. Uh, with the previous government, so it was the Commission Party who was investigating Odebrecht. He said that he had never received anything from them. Then he said that again in a, in a letter written, uh, sent to the Congress, to the committee investigating the uh, Lavarato um, case. He said again that he had never received. He said the same thing publicly several times. Neither him nor um, um, firms that he owns had received anything uh, from Odebrecht. Then Saturday, last Saturday, he said, well, maybe once we're, I got uh, one consultancy with this first capital um, uh, management fund that he has, and, um, and 
people said, well, but you have, you, you, yes, but you know, I he accepted that. Um, but then, now it's not only that, it's much bigger than that, and now, is, as I explained, it's, it's, uh, it's now a formal mm, crime. So what I don't understand is how can you uh, be so um, irresponsible on the consequences of your acts? He's not only um, putting him in a delicate situation, uh, but I hope it's not like in a Leonard Cohen song, right? Like a, I've seen the future and it's murder. Um, um, well, what we know is that the latest news I have is that this morning, <laughs> that this like two hours ago, Becerril, who is uh, maybe the spoke person for Fujimorismo, I'm just a bully, and, and it's not a, a literary metaphor. He, is, <laughs> he, he used to work as a bodyguard in, in a uh, hacienda. How do you say hacienda? I don't know. Um, and uh, so he has asked today, to, like a couple of hours ago, or maybe an hour ago, the president to resign, um, which I assume it means that Fujimorismo, who has the vast majority in the Congress, doesn't want to carry the weight of having sacked the president. So they will try, it seems so. Again, we're talking about things happening right now. Uh, they could play the card that make Kuczynski resign in order not to have the, um, uh, the that passive of, um, of uh, uh, of having been the ones that sacked him from, from office. Makes sense for me. Uh, it, I think they, they, they will. I would prefer that he is sacked by the Congress, if all this is true again. Um, on the legally front, which is a matter of uh, even if uncertainty, we are at the end of the day framed by those rules. Uh, if he is sacked or resigns, Martin Vizcarra, uh, vice president and current uh, ambassador, Peruvian ambassador to Canada, I suppose he's in a uh, plane, um, <laughs> warming up. And um, um, he's both ambassador to Canada and also the vice president. Yes, uh, and uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I. I won't explain you why, because it's kind of <laughs> embarrassing. But, um, <laughs> and so, if he, so he would be the, the, the next one in the um, line, if for political or uh, uh, juridical matters he cannot stay in office, it would be the second vice president, who's Mercedes Arau, who's currently prime minister. And if she, again, cannot stay in office, the next in line would be the president of the Congress, uh, Galarreta, uh, which is a Fujimorista, Fujimorista. And in that case, he should call for elections in six months. Uh, so he can only stay in power for six months. And we would have a new president in the, like in, by July or August, if all this uh, happens that way. Um, I think there is another scenario as well. It's uh, that actually Fujimorismo, which has again 57% of the legislative, they might see maybe as a good deal to have a um, president, a weak president like Vizcarra, that is actually um, hijacked uh, and that that can don't have any room of maneuver and that he will do whatever Fujimoristas want and they will be um, um, able to do what I think they want, which is infiltrate most of the institutions in the Peruvian state in order to assure that they win, uh, no matter how, the 2021 election. I think that's another possible scenario. Mm -hmm. um, I. I suppose part of the what is going to happen depends much, depends um, in, in a good deal. What is Keiko Fujimori thinking about an uh, advanced election? If she thinks that she can 
win that, maybe she will push for having um, elections soon. If she thinks that Paul suggests that people see Fujimorismo as the ones that brought in instability and that boycotted the government and that they, she will wait. That is my intuition. Uh, I suppose she has already ordered <laughs> several polls in order to uh, dilucidate that. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so we are in the middle of a situation where we have to try to think about um, how players are uh, we'll try to play those cards, but I think that's the the, the situation um, right now. What what about on the, on the second scenario with the uh, you know with the hijacked uh, Scatter? Could could they also make that same deal with with uh, the, with the president? In other words, to say that this is we've got you, and not not to insist on the resignation, but to say, you know, we're, we're basically, we're going to control things and we're going to call the shots and we're going to do what we want, and, and then we won't push too hard on the, for the resignation. I think it's possible, but, so, but for what has happened last night and this morning, which means it's um, all the Fujimorismo saying, President, resign, you're an embarrassment, uh, and Frente Amplio, which is the left-wing party in the Congress, has already presented a, a motion. I don't know what's the translation of that. Uh, a motion of, um, of uh, in order to ask the, the, the um, Kuczynski to be sacked from office. So it's already there, and I don't. It's it is less and less possible, uh, I think, to this idea of keeping Kuczynski and the Fujimorismo pushing for its agenda with him as a, a sort of a <coughs> puppet. I, 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 maybe a month ago it was more possible than today that so uh, many of them are asking for him to resign. So you don't, you don't see any scenario where the president has a strategy or an approach where he's able to hold on, given, given what's happened? Well, I think the, the, there is the option since I think maybe uh, at some point the media, entrepreneurs, technocrats, parties uh, in some sort of um, uh, pact in order to preserve stability, they decide that this step in impeaching him, it's... Um, too costly, risky. so they will the risky and cost for the um, um, stability of the country. So that's one scenario for sure. Um, but uh, but it implies that Fujimorismo is involved in that pact in order to sustain the president, which I don't think this moment is something that they really want. They don't want to be linked to this government that they are. They since they first they have tried to depict as uh, corrupt. Government, so it is. Uh, uh, but of course, I would not rule out uh, that Kuczynski manages in some way to um, stay in power, even if very weak. I mean, Fujimorismo doesn't exactly have the moral high ground on corruption, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so it's not like they can kind of, um, you know, portray themselves as this kind of anti-corruption. Well, I think and, the and really be credible on on that. But, but I think their main target was never to say that they are corrupt. The, the main target is to say, you know, Peruvians, we are all corrupt. Uh, so stop deciding elections on who's corrupt or not. Be, be, be aware that we are all, we have all drunk from that same poison water, right? Uh, and uh, so, uh, yeah. But no matter what of these scenarios happens, the economy is still going to grow at 4%, right? And everything's going to be uh, kind of, <laughs> inf investment will come in and... Somehow Peru will continue to, you know, defy all the, all, all the, uh, you know, all the laws of development. That <laughs> somehow that, that uh, somehow political crisis really affect economic performance, right? Or do you think that this is, this is different from other? I mean, politi When you say political crisis, this isn't the first political crisis Peru has, has had. If you look back on the previous presidencies, and yet you've had this really remarkable, impressive economic growth. It doesn't mean that, you know, it doesn't mean everybody's out of poverty, but, but certainly from a regional context, it's performed pretty well. 
and it's this, still this, and it's still performing. Right. I mean, for the for the neighborhood, it's uh, it's performing well. But is this is this what would you describe in the current the possible outcomes of this different? Or in other words, will this affect that, or do you think you know if uh, Iscardo or Mercedes Arauz or whatever is president, if this is if this happens, that this basically Peru will just continue on its path economically? Well. Or is this something? I think this is something that will um, maybe. I think the economy is slowing down independently from politics since, I mean, uh, um, since 2007. Seven, if you take the, the Peruvian economy um, curve, it's, it's clearly going down. So with ups and downs, but you know, if you, it's uh, from nine to one something this year. And, and uh, and this is something that I don't think is going to be. It's more. It's, it's been independent of the government. I think it, it it is related to an economy that is the levels of productivity are very low, uh, very um, huge informal sector um, institutions that doesn't uh, that do not work properly. So all that institutional, social, political context has been uh, playing against the uh, Peruvian economy, and this is going to hurt a little bit more, but I don't think uh, okay. uh, it's a major, um, for the economy at least, I don't think it's um, something that is going to kill or um, make it um, better. I have one more question, and then we're going to open it up. We'll start with Judy, but uh, and then Carlos, and I see a lot of people already on the edge of their seats uh, waiting, but I just... Uh, just one final question, um, going back to my sort of original, you know, the 18 months of, of this presidency, are there, are there some successes, uh, things that this government has accomplished that you think has uh, sort of helped address some of the problems, whether it's maybe security or you know, any area where if you look back over the first 18 months that you see some, some good results? Yeah, I think... Um uh, yes, so security, you said that. I think Carlos Vasombrio has been a uh, terrific uh, minister of um, interior. Um, he's done a great job, and he has, he's delivering, I think, numbers shows that at several crimes, like um, um, uh, petty crime and, and, and the, the crime that affects most people are... Um, um, going down um, everywhere, he has had some very uh, success in capturing many uh, criminal um, gangs. Uh, so he's doing an interesting job. He's the best minister of the interior that we have had in maybe 20 years, I think. Uh, only the fact that he's remained in office for a year and a half is already an achievement <laughs> for a minister of the interior in Peru, which they, they usually last not more than six or eight months. Um, and so it, he has not only last, but he has last with a plan, and I think that's something that deserves to be mentioned. Um, even without any support from the government, I mean, he's doing that uh, by on his own. And and actually, at several points, Fujimorismo asked for this guy to be um, sacked from, but he was lucky. There were the uh, El Nino first, and then something happened, and he has. Um, uh, uh, he succeeded in, in survive, uh, but not because he has any sort of um, support from the government. And the other aspect I think it's important to say also is foreign affairs, I think. Um, um, uh, I, I, at least for me, it was a, a shame that we had a government, the previous government was uh, so um, condescendent with Venezuela. I think uh, the role that Peru has played in, in terms of trying to articulate some sort of regional um, front in order to denounce what is happening in Venezuela, the dictatorship there, I think that's something I, I, I think it's a positive change from this government uh, regarding the previous one. Um, so um, great. Thank you. Good. Let's open it up. We'll start with Judy and then <coughs> Carlos. And just please tell us who you are. Uh, and Judy Brown. Get the microphone. Uh, Um, he himself, uh, I, 
I'm wondering about the pressure to find if there is a replacement to make sure that that person is clean. And he has had some issues around the bidding process for the Quito Airport. And I was just wondering if that puts the second vice president more in line or whether the first vice president, it's sort of like you said, they all drink from the same well. I just, I don't, just curious about that. We'll take some questions. Sure. Yeah. Carlos. Well, um, a couple of lines of speculation. Tell us who you are. I mean, yeah. Carlos Indagochea, Peruvian sociologist, independent consultant. A um, couple of lines of speculation. One is Peru used to have, as the rest of Latin America, when the political class was perceived as disqualified, it used to have a spare political class that was the upper echelons of the armed forces, right? Uh, how likely are we to fall in such a scenario that there would be some sort of that his vice president as ambassador in Mexico through his uh, first period? This is not unprecedented. It's a way of giving the vice president uh, some real thing to do um, and not interfere. Um, the um, other, uh, well, there's a piece of information here, which is uh, Pedro Pablo Kuczynski is not new to ac accusations of corruption since the 60s. Uh, he was instrumental in letting the International Petroleum Company get $20 million out of the Peruvian banking system when it was in a situation of expropriation. And he and, and, and uh, Carlos Rodriguez Pastor escaped Peru in accused of uh, having transgressed against the Peruvian state. I know that's unfashionable these days, transgress against the state, give me a break. Uh, but, th th but that was the case. Um, and um, well, let's leave it at that for the time. Yes, sir. We'll take a third and then we'll, go, we'll do another round, Enrique. Hi, uh, Danilo Garcia, uh, mining sector. Um, I was wondering if you could give us uh, your take on what would happen with foreign investment, uh, whether it goes one way or the other, um, and whoever it's going to take on uh, the government. So if it goes left or right, what would happen to foreign investment in Peru? Thank you. Roberto, you want to start with those three? OK. Um, so, yes, you're right. Vizcarra has these um, troubles from Chinchero Airport, and he uh, played that card um, hard. And at the end, he um, uh, had to resign. He was minister, and he had to resign because of that. Um, and um, and then um, and then the, the, the next in line is Mercedes Arauz, who seems to be now in a better relation with uh, Fujimoristas. Uh, but during the campaign, she was, um, they, don't, they don't spontaneously like her. Um, but maybe it's the one that can um, stand, stay in, in power. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, honestly, it's really up in the air. I, um, um, everyone can have something that will um, uh, make them fall, or maybe it's a matter of politics, and you suddenly real uh, can succeed in having some sort of coalition that can uh, uh, help you to stay in power for a while. Uh, I don't. The military, I don't really um, know. My sense is that they are in barracks, calm, and no, no. Big movements uh, so far. I don't. I don't think that uh, is something in the um, horizon. Um, uh, but you never know. Maybe not a sort of big general, but maybe you have some sort of troop somewhere that uh, uh, decides to um, make something in order to uh, show their uh, protest against all these developments. Could be. I don't know. I cannot. Rule out anything actually, <laughs> um, and um, and the other question on foreign investments. I don't think. Um, I think more than Peru changing something is foreign investors changing their minds about Peru. Maybe they have thinking a lot of time that this was like this being the poster child of uh, of economic management for what fifteen years. And so maybe it's not the country that is going to change, but the, 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 the investors are going to see, well, it, it was not as, uh, as good as it looked. Um, but, I, but I, yeah. And Mercedes Arauz was, was the opera candidate for president, right? 
She tried, tried. but uh, at the end she couldn't. So she was for like a few weeks. Okay. And then uh, the, the Partido Aprista, a sector of Partido Aprista, uh, boycotted her uh, candidacy. Okay. So she has no connections with uh, Garcia. Well, she was Minister of Economy, Economy in, the Garcia. In, in the Garcia and Vice Minister with Toledo. Right. And uh, so, <laughs> so okay. it's a yeah. group it's of a friends. <laughs> <laughs> Enrique, why don't we go to you? Yeah. Uh, over there, please. Thanks. Enrique Ortiz, uh, and the Amazon fund, and more as a Peruvian citizen. How is um, what, How do you see the connection of these recent acts of the judiciary sacking some of the Fuerza Popular uh, bases, and and also Alan Garcia's uh, presentation in the Congress a couple of days ago? Uh, how do you see the Kenji factor playing in this in the future? Thank you, Dan. Hi, Dan Erickson, Blue Star Strategies. Thanks for the presentation. I'd just like to know your opinion of Peru's kind of regional role, um, including the, uh, the fact that Kuczynski's kind of really prioritized uh, diplomacy around Venezuela in the situation there, and obviously it's the host of the Sun of the Americas. I understand we're kind of in the middle of a breaking news story, but we could just back out a little bit and see how has Peru been playing its role in the region, and then I guess you could look forward a little bit to how you see this influencing that. Thank you. Yes, sir, over there. Hi, uh, Alberto Hart from the Embassy of Peru. Just one question. Um, how do you see the maturity of the Peruvian population uh, in terms of the socioeconomic effects of this possible crisis? And what I mean is, it seems to me that, um, do you believe that Peruvians in general have begun to believe in social institutions, in civil society and democracy to an, to an extent where if the economy goes sour, they could still um, pursue this sort of political stability, or could the possible economic effects really have a knock-on effect on, on the social fabric of the country? Thank you. Why don't we stick with those three? I'll get you on the next round, the best. Roberto. Okay, um, so the question was on Kenji, right? Is that the, so Kenji, who's, the, um, who's um, Keiko's um, brother, little brother, uh, it is no secret that they uh, don't go well uh, quite long, uh, and they, um, uh, at the same time, I think Keiko has demonstrated that she's the one that rules the show. Uh, he can have some exposure some, uh, um, on media, but uh, she is the one ruling uh, the party. Actually, more than Kenji, what really puts her in peril is uh, Alberto, the father who's in jail. Um, he is the one that could truly bring some sort of um, um, schisma, schisma in, in, um, um, uh, in the Fujimorismo. Uh, so Kenji, I think it's a um, player uh, because of the father more than uh, because of himself. Um, about the Regional role, I, I think, a bit, as I said, I, I think Peru has been part of uh, also the uh, Pacific Alliance, which is the, the, the instrument of, of um, cooperation, uh, the, the one that is having some um, achievements. Uh, so uh, that's part of um, its role. Uh, the other thing is Venezuela, that I already um, said something. It's I. Uh, um, the, the problem is that those roles are, especially the political one, I think the economic one is going to last and in, independently uh, who is president for the uh, for, uh, next years. Uh, but um, the political one, it depends a lot on what, on politics, right? It's, uh, for example, um, I don't know, for example, it's interesting the fact that, yes, as I said, Peru has led the, the, the this group of Lima, the Grupo de Lima in the Venezuela situation, but at the same time, if Kuczynski um, um, pardons Alberto Fujimori uh, from jail, a, guy, a dictator that is in jail because of human uh, rights violations, of course, his role as someone protecting uh, democracy and going against a dictatorship will be diminished or eroded, because you cannot be like 
uh, the democratic uh, democratic star against a dictatorship when it's in the left, but you are very like um, uh, um, comprehensive or um, comprensivo actually uh, with the one on on the right. In so um, and it's the same. Imagine if there is a Fujimori government. Of course, Fujimorismo doesn't have any legitimacy in order to lead any role against uh, Maduro, neither on the on the um, human rights. Um, side or in the corruption side. I mean, what can they, um, in my take, is that they would not do anything. Um, so it depends a lot on the developments uh, for, for that. And population maturity, you know, I think it's, um, it's a, um, it's something that you have to win every time, right? It's not mature enough. <laughs> to count uh, on the population as it is, but it's not immature enough to just say, oh, we're, uh, we're in troubles with that kind of um, society. I think proof is that in the last, uh, in recent elections, several times, the candidates from especially Fujimorismo, uh, Keiko twice, um, has lost the election on the ground that she comes from a corrupt party, that she has an authoritarian background, and that she represents an authoritarian way of, of governing the country. And I think twice Peruvians were right. I mean, uh, w what we have seen from Fujimorismo in these last 18 months proved that we were right in rejecting her on those grounds. That, um, so I would not be um, dismissive on the population. I think population has reacted. Of course, they need leaders, they need campaigns in order to align with that. But I am confident in that people know that this party represent um, the, the, the authoritarianism that they, they have rejected uh, several times. Of course, if you don't have any leader on the other side and, 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 and this situation um, um, uh, goes uh, worse and worse, you can have a situation where that happens. But I think it's more like you have to campaign. If there's an economic uh, crisis, and then you have a Yes, I I think we don't have to assume that um, economic troubles uh, translate necessarily as a um, option for authoritarianism or rejecting democracy. I think it's um, maybe because I'm a political scientist, I have to defend the, <laughs> the autonomy of the uh, politics. politics. Okay, well, why don't we get two questions here, Marilisa and and Ambassador? Go ahead, we'll get some here. Thank you, Michael. Maria Luisa Rosel, Washington correspondent for RPP Noticias. If you compare the corruption, <laughs> hola. Careful. You compare. Careful. <laughs> careful, careful. If, if you compare the, the corruption crisis in Brazil and how Odebrecht triggered that uh, political crisis, you see that the prosecutors were independent. The way prosecutors are elected in Brazil is completely different, like in many other parts in Latin America. And in Peru, we don't have an independent judiciary system. So how can Peruvians trust in the way the judiciary system will follow up on all of these accusations against uh, the current president of Peru? And what's your, um, what's your explanation why the United States had not given um, Alejandro Toledo in extradition you know, for so many, many months now, and he's still here in, in the United States? Thank you. Great, thanks. Ambassador. Uh, Timothy Tell, 31 years, Foreign Service Officer, mostly in Latin America. And more importantly, I used to play squash with the President of Peru when he was at the bank, right across the street there at the University Club. That's very relevant. Uh, very relevant. <laughs> that means he's fast on his feet, sir. OK. Um, I'm going to follow up on your emphasis on corruption and your quotation, which I wrote down, that somebody said, we are all corrupt. So my question is, what is the policy of the government of the United States of America 
vis-a-vis -vis this Peruvian challenge. I see from my notes here, there's somebody from the US Department of Commerce. I'm sure they'll ask the White House. Somebody from USAID, that's called money. And some weird thing that says US government, don't ask what that is. Uh, we are all corrupt. But if we are all corrupt, there are people here in the fake news that says that the President of the United States is corrupt and the President lied too. What is the position of this man and this National Security Council vis-a-vis -vis this great crisis of corruption and leadership in this wonderful hemisphere of ours, sir? Thank you. Peter, and then we'll turn another. Berto, great analysis. Uh, it's Peter Hager. Is, what is your preferred uh, path now? What would you say is the best path for Peru? What, 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 what should happen, not what? might happen, what could happen, but is there a best path, in fact, or is there just a lot of different uh, possibilities and, you know, it's hard to identify a way out of the, th out of the forest? Okay. Do you want to take those three real quickly? Then we have others, but we'll get okay. to them. So um, we'll the, the, the fact that the judiciary is not independent, um, but it's neither fully taken by anyone. Um, so it's not the judiciary that we would like to have, but at least it has succeeded in, 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 in having some independency to um, um, uh, some presidents in jail, some uh, ministers, some generals, some, um, and so it is not as good as we would like, uh, neither independent, but I don't, I would not totally dismiss it as someone that is taken by someone so uh, that is not independent. Um, but I feel you're right that uh, people can legitimately, uh, legitimately ask, um, how can I trust these guys? Especially because um, it seems like, for example, four big um, entrepreneurs were uh, put in jail a week ago. Um, and at least the timeline is that Fujimorismo had to really ask for that and to threat the, the attorney general in order to ask for that. And then the guy asked prison for those. So there are some hints that um, it's not totally independent. But um, at the same time, I would not say that, it's, uh, that it is not. On Toledo, I really don't know why. Uh, I suppose it's a, a legal matter of how you ask for the uh, extradition. Um, but I agree that he should be there. I mean, it's kind of uh, evident what he did. And and it's uh, the money process. It's uh, um, On the US role, I don't know if there is if there's any. Uh, I, I don't think I'm the best person to ask for the US role on this corruption. Well, how are they? In this, I suppose they are as surprised as everyone, saying, "Well, who is not in this uh, <laughs> situation?" Um, and what's the best path? That's. Um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, I truly don't know. I, I, I think if it's. Um, so people in Peru, especially different kinds of elites, are always afraid about the anti-sistema, right? Oh, the anti-sistema is going to arrive and, um, OK. And now the idea is that because everything is involved in this, the anti-sistema will show up and the anti-sistema will, OK. But I don't think, <laughs> my sense is the anti-sistema will uh, show up if the system doesn't work properly. Um, so what I would like is that the judiciary, we go back to that, m makes his work properly and that uh, put in jail all the people that uh, has to be in jail. And not until now that it seems that uh, they are um, stronger, they are um, harsher with some and more um, mm, soft with others. And so I think the best path is that judiciary works properly with all these cases. Regarding who is going to be in charge in the country, I 
I don't really know. Maybe. Um, uh, <laughs> I, hmm? What is? Yeah. Um, so it is usually called is to describe someone that is against the economic model and democracy, some sort of populist that would put that in peril, right? Uh, that's uh, usually um, what is uh, depicted that way. Um, what I what I re the best path. So it's like I hope institutions more than people will rule this process. Thank you, Alec. Alec Watson was ambassador to Peru and a couple of years ago, Alec. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Alec Watson from Hills and Company. When you say that there's a general belief that everybody has been drinking from the uh, same uh, fire hose of corruption, I wonder, you haven't mentioned the left. And in the last election, a, uh, a leftist candidate did surprisingly well and a coalition on the left. And I wonder whether if everybody else is tarnished by the brush of corruption, whether it increases the possibility of some sort of leftist regime, perhaps not really radical left, not perhaps any sistema, but somewhat different from the last few regimes we've seen in, in, in Peru coming to the fore. Thank you. Yes, sir. Going back to Hi, Manuel Ayulo. I'm doing a, a master's in Georgetown, democracy and governance. Um, my question is, uh, many analysts of, of, of politics in Peru uh, have pointed out the surprising stability that the governments have had since Toledo, uh, Toledo, Garcia, Humala, and now uh, Kuczynski, in the economics and, and in the politics, in the level of democracy, in the quality of democracy. Uh, do you think that in a potential uh, uh, presence of Keiko, would this be a change of, the, of how the regime has been working since the fall of Fujimori in 2001, and why? Thank you. Yes. You have a question? Hi, Sofia Garcia. I work in the World Bank. Um, what are your, your takes on the role of the, coming back to the judiciary system, of the um, Tribunal Constitucional that is, I don't know how, how to say it in English, but it's like. It's constitutional court. court or, okay. Yeah. So, and like the, um, how the Fujimori regime, well, um, party start, is trying to take over this tribunal and what can be the reactions from them or from the judiciary system in general that can take a change on the, on the path of this crisis? Thank you. Carlos, we'll give you a second question. Brief. Third. 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 Sorry, third. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Third. Uh, you have proposed that uh, uh, Peruvians uh, have voted against Fujimorismo choosing whatever whatever, meaning Toledo, Garcia, uh, Umala, and so on. And you propose that as a test of maturity. We don't have any political parties, that is. We don't have any political communities with a common imagination of future. And we don't have political dynamics throughout the society, except for, of course, parliament, where it resembles a, a fruit and, and vegetable market. Uh, how come we are so mature? Thank you. Uh, Alberto. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna find one final question in here. Sorry. Hi, uh, Sofia Osmendi, former student of yours. Oh my God, uh, of his. Yes. <laughs> okay. I wanted to know, in the case of the impeachment, how long it could take according to the Constitution, and if you think that this is going to set an example for the region, if it's well, um, well done, let's say, or if it would just be a case of impeachment, like among others. Thank you. Alberto. Mm. Former students are always the toughest. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll be careful. <laughs> um, OK, so um, corruption in the left was the first question. Um, well, unfortunately, <laughs> um, they also drank from that same water. Um, Susana Villarán, the former mayor in Lima, received, uh, it seems, uh, all this has to be proved, but we're talking about the things that Olebrecht reveals. Um, so our, our um, 
attorneys, they don't discover anything, right? We have a Contraloría, we have attorneys and all that, but all we know is because someone <laughs> in the States or in Brazil tells, but not because, okay. Um, but so it seems that um, Odebrecht paid $3 million for the campaign of Susana Villarán, which was a left-wing mayor of Lima. Um, also, she said that she had never received anything, uh, and at the end, um, it seems that she had. Um, and, um, and then the other, uh, Il, the other um, wing of the left, which is Veronica Mendoza, which you said uh, arrived in third uh, place in the last election, She's also involved, not personally and not as clear as for the others, but she was, it seems, part of the Umala trips going to Venezuela to receive money from Venezuela. It's, a, it's another kind of uh, thing, but um, <coughs> political adversaries are played well the card in order to, that this fact is well known, right? And they always say that it is his um, letter, which is um, written in some Nadine Heredia, um, uh, notebook. Any, anyway, so it's it's an um, but I but it's clear that it's much less um, directly involved in these um, dynamics, which would could play um, in her favor for sure. But several of people with Veronica Mendoza, like Marisa Glave, a, 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 a um, congresswoman, was very close aide of um, Susana Villarán, so they will have this problem as well. I don't think they will succeed in being totally, um, um, have an image that is totally unrelated to that. Uh, political stability, uh, you were also my student, right? Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I, I think Keiko is a challenge for that, of, of course. And that is the reason why, actually, many of us, um, um, I think, at the end of the day, choose to vote for Kuczynski in the last election. I think the real, um, uh, uh, the, the, the real choice in that election was either to follow the same path, like a, Kuczynski was the candidate of pure continuity, so we will follow this patch of path of technocratic management whose priority is the GDP and the country and we don't care about anything else. Uh, or Keiko, that represent changing in order to have a more authoritarian country. Um, and I think we were right in framing the election in that way uh, in both sides. Uh, they have they have behaved as they promised to behave, right? Being PPK, just a technocratic guy that doesn't care about politics, that you don't really know, why, is, why does he want to be president, right? It's like, why, he doesn't have any plan, project, or anything for the country. Uh, so, um, and Keiko that we see want something, right? She has a project, I think. Uh, 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 maybe not really well designed, but at least uh, 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 an idea, una, an idea <laughs> una disposición, I would say, una, uh, to um, what she wants. What, um, what, what takes me to your question. Um, you aren't a former student, were you? <laughs> you're not. OK, good. Um, um, <laughs> uh, the, the question about this is linked to this, because I think Fujimorismo in these 18 months has proved they are, I think we have made a mistake, we make a mistake if we think that Fujimorismo is being the opposition of the PPK government. They are the opposition to democracy and the opposition to the rule of law, especially, even more than democracy. Um, so what they want is to infiltrate Poder Judicial. They, they have, um, I, I don't know what is exactly the translation of this. Uh, the the const denuncia constitucional is a tool of political control uh, from the parliament. So they have denounced the attorney general. They have denounced four out of the seven justices from the uh, constitutional court. Um, and I think they're, what they want is because now I think they, 
one sector of Fujimorismo think that they cannot win elections. I mean, they have lost twice against very bad candidates. I mean, Keiko Fujimori has lost against Umala and against PPK. I mean, it's difficult to find worse candidates than that, right? Uh, and, and, and so I think now they are not, they're no longer investing in the party, in having, head, in having uh, locals of the party in the country. Now the idea is to pack institutions in order to win on 21, no matter how. Um, and um, so, um, uh, so that's what I think. They, they are going to, to I, I don't. Um, The, 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 the reaction of the judiciary has been uh, to try to, you know, they, there was this um, statement from the attorney general with all the fiscales behind him and trying to show, uh, but with no support. I mean, the government has not supported them, uh, the media a bit, but don't forget also Keiko has a threat and it's, um, uh, El Comercio, which is the main newspaper. So um, all these are actions that we usually see from authoritarian populist governments in the executive branch, right? We're in innovating in political science. Now we have an authoritarian <laughs> that is built from the parliament, uh, which is uh, um, not that weird if you see all the weird things that Peru has um, <laughs> produced in the last 50 years. Um, um, so. Um, so yeah, so they will try to uh, take those um, institutions. And I'm sure that if they succeed in having a puppet president that they control, they, would, they will put, especially, they will go to the electoral institutions. They will put the guy in the Jurado Nacional de Elecciones and the guy in the, in the OMPE. They will, they will try to have those institutions for sure. Thanks. Is that and I think there was a... Um, um, oh, the, 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 the maturity in, yes, but you know, it's a, it's, that's the democratic, uh, the, like um, representative democracy, right? We, are, we, we vote, uh, we choose among what our, so we don't have, I, I, I always like this uh, idea of that. Sometimes people like to see that, you know, peoples have the, the, the leaders they deserve. I, the, it's more like Don't they. Tell us that. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is. It is. Yeah. It is. Um, it is more like they choose what among the candidates their elites produce, uh, and and so what it's been available. I think they have done the mature uh, choice uh, in the last elections, both at least for both uh, the. Um, elections in which Keiko Fujimori participated. They, um, and, and then the impeachment, how long? I think it's just it's as quick as you can think. It's just they vote. If they have the 87 votes for uh, impeach him, the guy is uh, immediately out of office. It's, I, I don't think it's longer, longer than that. Right. Oh, um, I don't, I don't. I don't know. It would be great if it's, if it sets an example for Peru, at least, right? But it seems that uh... <laughs> Alberto, maybe you could stay after. We're gonna we're gonna end the session now because uh, it's supposed to end at, at eleven. Uh, uh, but uh, we'll be following this uh, high drama as it unfolds in, in Lima. But I want to thank you for your great insights and perspectives. I want to thank everybody for co <coughs> for coming. <Thank> you. <coughs> great questions. Great questions and comments from all of you, and uh, have happy holidays to everybody. And we'll Thank see you, you back at the dialogue soon, I hope. Come back and be with us. Thank you. Thank you, Michael.